Welcome, everyone. We're very glad to have you all here uh, and joining us for core side session on child labor remediation upstream. My name is Danielle Bennett. I'm going to be your moderator for today. I work largely with the chorus complaint mechanism um, and specifically on the investigations. But I was also the CORE's team lead on the garment sector study, which we published last year, so February 2023. And we launched that study at uh, last year's OECD forum. So I'm particularly excited to be talking about this subject today. And it's really the driving, that study in particular was really the driving force behind today's session. So I'm going to just start with a few housekeeping things before we get into the program. Um, I wanna remind you that we do have French and Spanish interpretation. Uh, and if you're looking for that, it's just a button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and I'll just note for myself mostly and for our panelists that we should speak slowly so that our interpreters can give the best experience possible to our audience. Uh, I should also remind you that our session is being recorded. Uh, so just be mindful of that. Our recording will be up on our website shortly after the close of the session. Um, we are also supported by Oxygen Events today and specifically Mike Greenwood from Oxygen. Um, I might just check in with Mike right now and make sure I haven't forgotten anything in terms of housekeeping. Mike, is there anything you want to flag? No, just a reminder that there is a language interpretation English and French at the bottom, and you can use the Q&A button to submit any questions to our panelists today. Great, thanks, Mike. Okay, we have a very packed uh, program for you today. So without any further delay, let's get into things. So I'd like to um, welcome uh, Ms. Sherry Meyer Hoffer, Canada's first ombudsperson for responsible enterprise. So Sherry is going to um, give a, a brief presentation on the core and introduce us to some key concepts. So Sherry was appointed uh, in April 2019, as she is a Canadian lawyer with 17 years experience in the upstream oil and gas industry, and 13 years experience in international governance, rule of law, and human rights. She's worked in many different countries, Bhutan, Bolivia, Cuba, India, Jamaica, just to name a few. And as Ombud, she has a mandate to review alleged human rights abuses arising from a Canadian garment, mining, or oil and gas company's operations abroad. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Sherry. Thank you, Danielle. And good morning, bonjour, and welcome to those of you joining us from around the world. My name is Sherry Meyerhofer, and I am the Canadian Ombudsperson for Responsibility enterprise, or the core, as my office is referred to. I would like to begin today's webinar by acknowledging and recognizing that I am joining you today from traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabek people, land on which the office of the core is located as well. As a business and human rights ombud, the rights of Indigenous peoples in Canada and around the world are integral to the work we do. Today's web, um, for today's session, I will begin with a short presentation on the CORE's mandate and work, and will present an overview of child labor remediation concepts to set the stage. This will be followed by a panel discussion with our four experts, moderated by Danielle Bennett, who you have just met, our business and human rights analyst at the CORE. After the panel, we will open the floor to questions. Please use the Q&A function to send your questions at any time during the panel. We will do our best to address them during the Q&A period. And finally, just as a reminder that simultaneous interpretation is available in French and Spanish, Spanish and that the webinar is being recorded. For those of you that are unfamiliar with the core, my office was established in 2019. After nearly two decades of pressure from Canadian civil society, on the Canadian government to establish an independent body to provide a mechanism to resolve disputes and seek remedy for those harmed. We are a business and human rights ombud institution, the only one of its kind in the world. Our mission is to promote respect for human rights and responsible business conduct for Canadian companies working outside of Canada in the garment, 
mining, and oil and gas sectors. Our mandate consists of four components. First, we promote human rights and responsible business conduct using the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, or the UNGPs as they're referred to, and the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. Second, we advise Canadian companies and also the Canadian Minister of International Trade on best practices related to responsible business conduct in our three, in our three sectors. Third, we review complaints, which is central to our mandate. Fourth, we recommend actions and remedy for those harmed and to prevent similar harm from happening in the future. For example, to companies, I can recommend they make financial compensation or apologies for those harmed or make changes to their corporate policies and practices. To the Canadian Minister of International Trade, I can recommend policy reform or trade measures against companies if they do not co cooperate. As mentioned, an important component of our mandate is the review of complaints. This means that impacted individuals, groups, communities, or their representatives can submit complaints anonymously if they wish to the core. Pursuant to our admissibility criteria, the complaint must be about possible human rights abuses involving Canadian companies, including their suppliers and business partners, working outside of Canada in the garment, mining, or oil and gas sectors. This graphic illustrates the different stages that a core complaint may follow. The process is not necessarily linear. For example, complaints may move from investigation to mediation and back again if the parties agree. In the first two stages, intake and initial assessment, they are about obtaining more information, reviewing admissibility, and engaging respectively with the parties to find a solution. If a solution is not possible at the initial assessment stage, we address the next steps, looking to either mediation or investigation. For mediation or stage three, if the parties agree, a mediator helps them try to find um, try to find uh, reach a settlement of the complaint. Regarding stage four, if I decide to launch an investigation, the core would gather information either through joint fact finding or independent fact finding. In the follow-up stage, we monitor compliance with our recommendations made to companies and to the government. I would like to briefly mention some data about our current complaints and investigations. As of December 31st, 2023, we are reviewing 21 active complaints at various stages of the complaint process. You will note that 14 of our complaints are in the garment sector, while seven are in mining. The complaints come from various countries and relate to different types of allegations of human rights abuses. To date, the Corps has also published 10 initial assessment reports and launched nine investigations, eight of which are in the garment sector. Since the publication of these initial assessment reports, the cases, received wide, the cases have received widespread international media attention. But more importantly, and this is where I want to draw your attention, the publication of these reports generated an increase in cooperation from companies in our complaint process, which has led to favorable outcomes for the parties. One complaint was withdrawn by the complainant due to a satisfactory response or remedy from the company, and we are confident that there are more successes to come. So why is the Corps hosting this webinar? Well, in addition to our active complaints, the Corps, as Danielle mentioned earlier in her introduction, conducted a Canadian garment sector study on child labor in 2022, and we published our findings um, a year ago in 2023. We found that the Canadian garment companies are still at the beginning of their journey to respect child rights, and there is still a great need for raising awareness about the issue. And a lot of these findings can apply to companies that are based or have activities in other countries. Of the seven main findings from the study, I would like to draw your attention to three. First, we found that less than half of the companies interviewed trace where their garments are produced. If they do, they generally only focus on the first two tiers of production. This means that they do not trace garments where the likelihood of child labor is probably the highest in tiers three and four. Also, only two out of the 10 participating Canadian companies 
experienced a confirmed case of child labor in their global supply chains. However, this does not mean that other instances of child labor don't occur. Rather, it may well indicate the need for companies to better identify child labor in their global operations and to improve supply chain transparency. Third, while most participating companies in the study stated they never had a confirmed case of child labor, some indicated they would terminate the business relationship if, the, if a case was identified. However, this approach does not align with child labor remediation best practices. With these findings, we also put forth five recommendations in this report, one of which specifically recommends that Canadian garment companies expand their approaches to remediation. Because when Canadian companies increase their supply chain transparency at lower tiers, they are likely going to identify more cases of child labor. Companies, therefore, need effective child labor remediation mechanisms in place where termination of a supplier relationship is the last resort. I would also like to highlight the prevalence of child labor around the world, and particularly in the garment sector. According to the ILO and UNICEF, an estimated 160 million children were engaged in child labor globally as of 2020. Nearly half are subjected to hazardous work, and nearly half are children between the ages of 5 and 11. As of 2020, the number of child laborers increased for the first time in 20 years most likely due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The risk of child labor is particularly high in the garment sector, and the challenges of addressing it are unique given the complexities of global supply chains. It is also difficult to assess the exact number of child laborers in the sector. However, a significant source of child labor is found in the agriculture sector, which includes cotton growing and the production of garment raw materials. And while in recent years, some focus has been directed towards remediating human rights impacts in tier one, less emphasis has been placed on how companies can remediate impacts through tiers two to four, where most incidents occur. Before moving forward, let's remind ourselves of the four tiers. The tiers or levels of production refer to the various steps by which a garment is produced. These tiers are all part of the garment supply chain. The activities within each tier may vary depending on the garment, but are generally composed of the following. Tier four refers to raw materials production. This includes the activities involved in growing or producing the raw materials for a garment, such as cotton growing for a t-shirt, livestock production for leather, oil production for synthetic fibers, and production of garment materials from recycled goods. Tier three refers to fiber production, or the activities involved in turning the raw materials into thread or yarn. This may also include the ginning and spinning of fibers. Tier two is fabric production, which includes activities involved in producing fabric, such as weaving, dyeing, or tanning. This could also include other pieces used on garments, such as producing buttons, zippers, Velcro, and others. Tier one is garment production, which refers to the activities involved in putting gar uh, together garments, such as sewing t-shirts. While seemingly straightforward, the garment supply chain is typically very complex as each tier of production and materials may be located in several countries. Raw materials could be produced in one country, such as China, while fiber production takes place in another, such as India. Production activities can also be completed by a range of different suppliers in both the formal and informal sectors, such as engaging home-based workers. It is also important to take a closer look at the definition of child labor, as many people are surprised to learn that not all child work is child labor. According to the ILO, child labor is defined as work that deprives children of their childhood, their potential and their dignity, and that is harmful to physical and mental development. More specifically, child labor refers to one or more of the following. First, work done by a child who is under the minimum age of admission to employment for the type of work. And two, work that interferes with compulsory education. This means that if a child is above or at the minimum age requirement, which is often 15, and is involved in work that interferes with their ability to attain basic education, it is child labor. 
Child labor can also refer to work that is likely to jeopardize a child's health, safety, or morals, known as hazardous work. And this applies to any child under 18 years. Child labor can also refer to other worst forms of child labor besides hazardous work. This includes um, all forms of slavery, sale and trafficking of children, or the use of children in illicit activities. And what does remediation mean then? Well, according to the UN Guiding Principles for, um, Reporting Framework developed by Shift and Mazars, remediation refers to both the process of providing remedy for a negative human rights impact and the substantive outcomes that can counteract or make good the negative impact. In other words, remediation is really about addressing human rights impacts. With regards to child labor remediation, According to the UNGPs and the OECD guidelines, where a company identifies the use of child labor in their global supply chain, the company should provide for or cooperate in legitimate processes to remediate the situation in the best interests of the child. Each incidence of child labor requires a ta tailored approach, depending on age, country context, type of work, among other factors. Our panelists today will discuss the strategies, steps, and practices in greater detail, but here are some basic steps which usually apply. First and foremost, it is critical to remove the child from the work environment and ensure that they are in a safe location while immediate action is being taken. Second, it is important to engage with the child and their parents to understand their needs. This means making sure that the child themselves understands what is happening and has an opportunity to express their needs. Third, remediation also involves using the, ensuring the child is able to attend daytime schooling or that the family will have access to alternate forms of income. Otherwise, the child may end up back at work. Remediation clearly involves financial support, but should also ensure that compensation is provided equivalent to the amount the child earned while employed during the remediation process. Keep in mind that remediation can be a lengthy process involving both short and long-term steps that requires clearly defined roles and responsibilities by those involved. So this includes my, uh, concludes my introduction. I look forward to hearing from our esteemed panelists on strategies and practical steps that companies can adopt when facing child labor. Now back to you, Danielle. Thanks, Sherry. All right, so let's get going on our panel discussion. Um, just as a reminder, we of course uh, welcome any questions that you might have as we proceed through the panel discussion. So pop those into the Q&A, try and put them in the Q&A versus the chat. That's how we're going to, um, that's how we're gonna do this thing. Um, and uh, I'll try and probably keep my uh, interventions uh, limited and stick quite closely to the questions because I know we have quite a big audience here um, and I do want to give an opportunity for active engagement um, and uh, answering your questions as part of this panel discussion. So uh, I'd like to introduce our panelists to start with and in no particular order we have Catherine Torres so she is a senior program officer on fundamental principles and rights at work in supply chains at the International Labour Organization. She develops and manages partnerships that connect governments, businesses, trade unions, and communities to tackle violations of human rights at work in global supply chains. Additionally, she provides policy advice to public and private actors on responsible sourcing and good governance. Her professional experience includes the practice of business and international law in Europe, Latin America, and the U.S. Next, we have Dr. Anne-Marie La Rosa. She's the Senior Advisor on Law and Policy at the ILO, coordinating the organization's activities for establishing protection programs against industrial disasters in contexts where national systems are particularly deficient, and contributes to the development of new remedy intervention models involving the private sector. She's a lawyer by training with over 30 years of operational experience working with international organizations. Next, we have Riri Malakai as the Director of Public, uh, as the Director of Services and Products Asia at the Center for Child Rights and Business, which is also known as the Center. 
He has over 10 years of experience in rights issues, particularly child rights uh, and protection, labor migration and human trafficking, maternity rights, and sustainable and responsible business. So her portfolio mainly covers countries in Asia Pacific, as well as several African countries such as Uganda, Ghana, and the Ivory Coast. And last but not least, we have Sylvia Mera, who serves as Goodweave International Senior Director of Strategic Partnerships and Advocacy. So in this capacity, Sylvia leads the organization's advocacy and external relations, including donor relationship building, involvement in multi-stakeholder initiatives, and thought leadership. She previously managed Goodweave's apparel and fashion jewelry portfolio. Sylvia has 12 years of experience in international development, strategic partnership, development with businesses and NGOs, and program design and management. So welcome to our wonderful panelists. Thank you all for being here today. We very much appreciate it. Um, and I think we will just dive right into our first question. So I think to start off with, um, I'd like to kind of set the scene in terms of why child labor remediation is important. And I think I will put this question to you, Catherine, maybe to start us off. Um, so I'm wondering if you can tell us why child labor remediation is important and in particular, why it's important for companies to look uh, at upstream risks with respect to child labor. Thanks, Daniela. It's really a pleasure uh, to join you from the I.O. here in Geneva. Thanks for the invitation and thanks a lot to Sherry for having framed this conversation around ILO standards, the core standards on, on child labor. So that actually saved me a few, a few words during my intervention. Now, I think as Sherry mentioned, uh, what we have seen in the garment cotton supply chain is very important progress at the first years of uh, supply chains in terms of child labor, but less attention and somehow a lot of fragmented efforts at the lower tiers of supply chains and particularly on the cotton um, production and extraction. The recent report that was done by the Alliance 8.7 show with data for the first time that between 23% and 48% of child labor uh, it occurs actually in the global supply chains at the extraction or production of raw materials. So what this data says is that all our efforts will be inadequate if we don't look at the lower tiers of the garment and cotton supply chain where the most risks are severe and harmful to children. A lot of the qualitative data that the ILO has actually conducted and the studies that have been produced show that not only the scale of the problem is very important, but also the harm to children is very severe. So in most of the areas of cotton production, we see actually worse forms of child labor. And by that means that actually we are looking at having children affected in terms of health or physical or emotional uh, status for a long, long time. Injuries, pesticides that have actually created uh, respiratory problems, accidents in, in the different plantations, and more and more increased work in very high temperatures because of climate change. So we're not only looking at the scale, we're also looking at the harm of the, of the problem for children. So remediation at this level is not only urgent, but extremely important. Most of the time, it would be very hard to bring children to the situation before child labor, before they started working on plantations. And that means actually that the remediation needs to occur as early as possible when child labor is identified at those levels. The two other things I want to mention very quickly are um, that a lot of the work that's being done currently, because there are some important efforts on child labor remediation through certification, for instance, have proven to be very inefficient and with very little impact on a sustainable scale. Um, so there is time, and I think this conversation is very timely to discuss what are the new solutions out there, what are the new efforts coming from different organizations like the ILO and my fellow panelists that could be a scale up. We understand that it's an overwhelming problem, but there are currently very important efforts that could help to build solutions on, on scale. And the last thing I want to share, because the ILO has been discussing with a lot of companies on this issue, is the more we take time to address trial labor and supply chains, and particularly the linkages with poverty, the more will be short labor force shortages 
at the raw material level. So I don't think, I think cotton, like any other global commodity suffering from uh, labor shortages is harder and harder to find for businesses actually adequate labor that is willing to work in agriculture or in other global commodities at that level. That means that perhaps today it's a problem that can be somehow mitigated, but in a few years time, it will be much more difficult to find families and decent jobs for adults that are willing to stay in this type of activity. So the more we concentrate today on tackling child labor and addressing decent work at that level of the supply chain, the more sustainable the supply chain will be. I end up with uh, these very few points on why it's important. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. That's very helpful, um, I think, for uh, kicking off this conversation. And I, I'm actually going to stay with you, I think, um, for the next question, because I think it, it, it moves nicely uh, into this one. So I'm wondering how child labor remediation fits within uh, a broader human rights due diligence process. So we know companies are meant to establish this under the UNGPs. Um, and of course, as well, uh, remediation under the UNGPs. So how and where does it fit within the HRDD process? Thanks, Anil. That's an important uh, discussion. What I think we have seen in terms of the efforts that have been taken by some of the companies that are looking at child labor at the lower tiers of the supply chain, and particularly in cotton, is that there is a very strong focus about, okay, we have identified X number of children, we need to remove it from the workplace and try to find partners to remediate the issue as soon as possible. The very important missing part of the picture is what are the other stages that need to be included within that judicious process. And first of all, is a component on, okay, what is the prevention angle of our work here? This is completely missing for most of the work that currently is happening on child labor in the cotton production. Prevention is key, and there is no, no other solution that would help us eradicate child labor at any given tier of the supply chain without looking at prevention. And of course, it's an overwhelming task. We all know, particularly when it's very far from your operations, when it's very informal, because that's what happens uh, in the cotton production, where it's, we're speaking about small holders, where it's speaking about actually a lot of um, public authorities not having the leverage and the capacity to tackle some of the root causes of child labor. But it's key. And part of that key uh, response is to start looking at the root causes, starting by decent work deficits for adults and young people. There are very good examples of how the ILO with partners and my fellow panelists are looking at that prevention angle by looking, for instance, at what are the conditions for young people to participate in cotton production. And Sherry mentioned at least, uh, some of the important angles to be looked at in terms of participation of young people in cotton production and where are the conditions to make it to make sure that we don't fall into hazardous child labor. And then decent work for parents. That includes, of course, working conditions. That includes non-discrimination by addressing the needs of women and mothers in the supply chain. And that also includes, obviously, uh, the income levels of uh, small holding families in particular. So prevention, it's key. All the efforts that we will do without prevention will not lead to sustainable impact. Now, a lot of this work requires broader collaboration, and we'll speak about that in terms of governments involvement and trade unions and cooperatives, for instance. But what I really want to trigger here the attention and, and to look at is if you are currently working on remediation at that level of the supply chain, you are not working on prevention and at systemic root causes of child labor, a lot of the work that you are doing is probably and very likely not to be sustained. Thanks, Catherine. Yes, I think uh, we are going to pick up on on this prevention piece um, a, a little further on. Of course, you know, child labor remediation, we can't talk about that in a vacuum. It exists within a broader, uh, more holistic approach. Um, our, our, some of our questions today are going to be quite targeted, but it, it's important, I think, to keep that in mind. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to pose the next question. I think, well, we'll start with Sylvia and Riri, maybe, and then I'll open it up and see if anyone else has anything else they want to add in. Um, but I would like to hear a little bit about some of the challenges regarding child labor remediation that companies might be experiencing. Um, and specifically, 
you know, in light of the conversation and our topic today, specifically upstream, what challenges might they be having um, with remediation upstream? So, Sylvia, did you want to lead us off on this one? Thank you for the question, Danielle, and great to be here with you and the other panelists and our audience. Um, three challenges I can mention are lack of visibility, low leverage, and the need to adapt remediation strategies. There are others, but I can focus on these three. Um, and by lack of visibility, I'm not referring to um, the, the lack of visibility of suppliers within supply chains. That's certainly a problem. But there is also a lack of visibility of where child labor is and how it manifests, even by companies that are doing a better job at tracing their supply chains. Um, companies still struggle with identifying child labor. The um, report that CORE published uh, that was referred earlier today um, conducted interviews with 10 companies and only two stated that they actually came across a case of child labor. And this happens in our work too. We see it all the time. So in, we work in, uh, in, a, in subcontracted supply chains and we map sometimes hundreds of work sites where we find over 95% of cases of child labor, but the companies only had the visibility of a handful of tier one suppliers. So this tells us that companies are still not looking in the right places. Their grievance mechanisms are not being effective. Um, and this really hinders the development of effective remediation processes. Um, secondly, leverage. Influencing upstream suppliers can be difficult. Uh, I know we're going to address this in, in the panel today, too. Um, the more business relationships become distant and indirect, the more direct influence diminishes. And so this makes it difficult to um, enforce the action that producers need to implement to, to provide remedy. And finally, on adapting remediation strategies. Um, we heard in the introduction uh, of the topic that um, upstream suppliers may be in uh, uh, different contexts. They operate in different countries, sometimes even in different sectors from tier one. And so companies that have a one size fit all strategy or want to implement a strategy, remediation strategy tailored on large tier one garment factories, for example, will need to rethink how to uh, implement these strategies at the cotton level or the uh, processes and components level. So um, I can conclude with these thoughts. Uh, certainly there are challenges. Uh, and um, um, I, one thing I don't think is a challenge is the lack of resources, because sometimes companies would say that they invest already a lot of resources with their tier one suppliers. Um, they don't have enough for upstream suppliers. But any company that is doing the sensible thing of tracing their supply chains better should uh, expect to identify more cases of child labor, which is a good thing because it means that their traceability is working, but they should also adequately budget to then address cases they identify. Yeah, and just to underscore that point with the study, um, we I, we specifically identified that in the report that the, the, the two uh, companies who had identified child labor, it was not likely uh, uh, or, or it wasn't the fact that only two could find it. it, you know, it's endemic within those supply chains. And so it's likely that visibility is the issue there. And that once that visibility increases, as you say, Sylvia, then, then, then you'll find more cases, which is good because then you can then implement those processes. Riri, did you, can, I wonder if you can add in um, uh, your experience on this and what you've seen. Yeah. First of all, thank you for having me. And I think what was just mentioned and explained by Catherine and also Sophia, I would just add to that. For example, I totally agree with the buyer's low leverage. And we, so so at the center, we handled nearly a thousand cases uh, of child labor at the moment, either it's being closed or still ongoing at the moment. And we've seen that cooperation levels uh, get lower the deeper we get into the supply chain. For example, that 90%, we observe like 90% of cooperation in cases found in tier one, direct suppliers of our client. And it reduced to 80% if the case is found in first tier, but it's in direct supplier. Meaning that, um, that this is indirect supplier of our client, but they can be um, connected directly to the international market as well. 
and and that success rate of cooperation reduced to 80 percent and what happened when we go to the subcontractor level our remediation planning and engagement significantly dropped to only 50 percent if it in subcontractor level and even less than 20 percent of cooperation if the cases were found in unauthorized subcontractors our data shows that you know this cooperation levels is very important for us to go ahead and kick off the remediation but unfortunately the lower it gets in the, in the supply chain, then the lower the corporations probably that we will get to kick off the remediation itself. And also aligned with Sylvia's explanation, for example, on how, you know, I think also in, in the other side that the companies, especially these upstream suppliers, they are actually struggling in navigating the complex regulatory landscape, right? Where we've seen the upstream suppliers, they oftentimes, they did not fully understand the buyer expectations or any supply chain due diligence law, or any code of conduct related to how to best approach this child labor remediation. For instance, that we recently failed to kick off remediation program due to the non-cooperation from the families of the children that we identified because of intimidation from the factory management. And at the same time, we also could not obtain, for example, age-proof document to verify the age of the child because the factory does not have this, they do not maintain such information, and they lost contact with the suspected child labor and their families, and such contact cannot be re-established. So we think that from our experience, this is where we found buyer needs to send a super clear message and procedure that can remove the upstream suppliers' uncertainties, you know, to ensure better cooperation from the factory management, especially when the families needed to be involved in the remediation, where we know child labor remediation is the, such a very important uh, role to play by the family members as well, like parents to be involved as well in the remediation. So I think I'll stop there and then we can discuss some more um, you know, related to this remediation. That's great, thanks Riri. I just want to turn to our other panelists in case there's anything um, that uh, Catherine or Emery that you would like to add to that. Nothing for the moment, Daniel, from my side. Okay, wonderful. All right. Um, so we know that companies can be involved with human rights impacts in three different ways, right? The UNGPs tells us that companies can cause human rights impacts, they can contribute to them, or they can be directly linked to them. So if we think about upstream suppliers in the garment supply chain, um, not always, but usually, I think companies would be directly linked or would be contributing to instances of child labor. And I'm wondering if we can kind of talk about the differences in approach. You know, are, is there a difference in approach? What's the expectation on companies um, under the UNGPs with respect to remediation in these um, sort of three categories of involvement? Um, so I'm wondering, actually, maybe Riri, we can turn back to you and you can pick this up first. Sure. So. Um, again, based on our experience, we uh, we work with our clients and we say to our clients that companies should perceive child labor as business risks that needs a strong commitment to mitigate and remediate it. You know, taking example, for example, safety briefing, right? Where companies doing it every morning or regularly before the workers start working or before any training or workshop or meeting, they will be telling you, where is the exit, you know, in case fire happening, this and that. Or maybe some companies is doing earthquake preparedness briefing in the areas that are prone to natural disaster. This is how business usually regulate and mitigate the risks, right? The point is not that we will 100% avoid earthquake to happen, or there will be no work injury at all, or there will be no fire happening by doing all of those risk mitigation and briefing. But when such situation happens, then they know how to handle it. They know who to call. They know what steps to take. Now think about child labor as such kind of business risk. You know, for companies who are sourcing, let's say, from countries where poverty rate is high, where access to education is still limited, where corruption is still rampant, then those companies should understand that child labor is part of their business risk to operate and sourcing from that country. 
Hence, they should take all of the necessary precautions, understanding the risks, put in place a strong policy commitment, have a set of implementation plan to mitigate and remediate cases of child labor, and capacity building clear communication of due diligence expectation to their supply chain partners and have actually a functional grievance mechanism. Thanks, Riri. Yeah, what I'm hearing from you is uh, in reference to the business risk is really a call to integrate those policies and procedures throughout the business's operations. Um, Sylvia, did you wanna uh, add anything to this? I can. Um, you refer to the uh, UNGPs, Danielle, and the UNGPs are quite clear on what are the responsibilities, um, depending on whether companies directly cause, contribute, or have a link to, to human rights abuse, in this case, child labor. I think in practice, it's very hard uh, for company to draw a specific, uh, like a hard line. Um, and I don't know of many companies that actually assess their links to child labor um, regularly. So if a case happened, especially in upstream tiers that we established, uh, companies don't have visibility into, it would be quite hard for them to know immediately whether that cause contribute or just there is a link. Um, I also think that companies should uh, consider very thoroughly um, how big and profound the responsibility is um, um, regardless of like their link or direct causation or contribution. I think crises like the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with the decision of canceling billion of dollars in orders in the garment sector is, uh, specifically has demonstrated what catastrophic ripple effects decision taken downstream can have throughout the supply chains and well beyond the tier one suppliers. So with that said, um, I think companies that are linked or contribute to child labor should still acknowledge the harm and play a substantial role in uh, contributing to its remediation. Um, of course, the responsibility still lies with the entity that caused the harm directly, but companies have a responsibility to facilitate remediation. Um, and I don't think there is a substantial difference in approach, but um, linking to what was said before about leverage, the more uh, indirect and distant the business relationship is, the less prescriptive a company can be in simply expecting that the, child, that the remediation will happen. There needs to be a collaborative approach. Um, there needs to be, of course, a, a quick urgent solution, but also uh, there needs to be capacity building and support of those suppliers to prevent uh, recurrence. And the approach will require more effort and more time since uh, upstream suppliers are several steps removed from the company. So it's harder to communicate with them and they're harder to influence. And these are cases where working with local partners that can be a liaison between the company and the suppliers is particularly effective because uh, local partners can help navigating these difficult exchanges. Um, and I can conclude with a quick example from our own work. We work with companies that partner with us to reach informal suppliers. So these are subcontractors that are beyond their, their tier one um, the exporters with whom they have a direct relationship. Um, and sometimes companies would have a no subcontracting policy. Sometimes they would have no guidance at all. But somewhere in their supply chains, we almost of always find subcontractors and that's where we find child labor. Now, companies may say that's just a link, you know, child labor is somewhere in their supply chains, but they even ask the, the suppliers not to, to subcontract, right? But still through our program, they commit to play a role in remediation. And through us, they ensure that there is a commitment to um, enable remediation and especially there is a non-retaliation. So we tell uh, suppliers, tier one and subcontractors that we will have a collaborative approach. There will not be, um, you know, um, they will not be cut off from the business relationship. And that really helps navigating these situations. Thanks for that, Sylvia. And for kind of giving us some insight on Goodweave's um, practices in that area. And I want to pick up actually on, on two points that you mentioned, the first one being leverage. Um, and then the second, we'll, which we'll get to is sort of the stakeholder engagement. 
So on the point of leverage, I'm wondering if maybe um, we can just discuss how companies can effectively use their leverage. So if that's one of the big points um, in terms of remediation upstream, um, you know, how should companies engage or increase their leverage? How should they use their leverage? Can you give us maybe some examples um, of good practices in that area? Maybe Sylvia, do you want to start us off, and then I'll I'll, I'll uh, connect with the other panelists as well. Sure. Uh, yeah. So linking to what I was saying before, the farther away a company is from a direct business relationship, the more cooperation and dialogue need to to prevail. Um, so a way to use leverage is to enlist the suppliers with whom the company has a direct relationship in the effort. So what Riri was saying, if tier one. Uh, cooperates, then there is a higher chance of success in upstream tiers too. Um, it's also important and possible to leverage, um, to use leverage or increase leverage through partnering with other companies and industry associations. Um, and uh, this helps pooling influence, pooling resources, pooling expertise, and collaborative initiatives have a wider reach because they can set industry-wide standards in a specific country and facilitate collective action. And this is much more resource efficient than going supplier by supplier, um, providing a capacity building program, for example. Um, it's also important to have to establish contact with upstream suppliers, again, for those the company has visibility of before an incident occurs. So not make the first point of contact a problem, but organizing uh, um, you know, programs that support their understanding of rights, um, what requirements are there, how requirements are cascaded down the supply chain. Um, and this way they will be more prepared to manage the expectations that arise when there is an actual case to remediate. Um, and finally, investing in prevention. So. I think that remediating a case mm -hmm. may feel very prescriptive or an ask when the case happens, um, but sometimes um, it is easier to um, work with suppliers on community-wide prevention because then they feel and they understand there is a value add for the whole worker communities. And that helps, uh, um, uh, you know, um, if, if they are linked up with local resources, um, they will, it will be perceived more like a shared goal and shared responsibility. Mm -hmm. Riri, did you want to jump in there too? Yeah, yeah. I think I've, I've seen, I just want to make a point that we've seen that buyers might lean too much on the sanction side of the, you know, oftentimes we found the offending factories are excluded from orders for a very long time. And we also found situation where buyers immediately cut business once child labor case is found, instead of showing understanding and support set a very clear expectation and doing everything possible in their power to ensure remediation pro process can be kicked off. You know, so, um, and recently we've seen that where, where companies just cutting off their, um, you know, suppliers very easily once child labor case is found, which we don't see it will be helping a lot on the child labor remediation component because then they will just, you know, stay away, putting distance from their um, suppliers by cutting off the business relationship. So we always suggest companies to resume placing orders when the factory, their supplying factory, is taking substantial steps in remediating the child labor cases, you know. And, and also another thing that um, I really like the point that Catherine said where child labor remediation should start immediately, you know, because a day in in the, a day more for the child in the hazardous work, it's just unbearable, right? So we also see how, um, you know, the, this, this leverage thing can also play a role in there. Like many of these uh, companies we've seen, um, like at least a number of them, where they like more to do this from a landscape approach or taking a long-term approach to tackle child labor, the root causes of child labor by, you know, working with the government on putting in place some regulations or joint action with the other buyers to do something, a very, you know, like helicopter view, like community approach. It is okay. It is great. I mean, like we've seen so many impactful uh, results coming out of it, but what's missing there oftentimes 
when it, it comes to the short term that the child labor is really in front of their eyes and we've seen this in cotton um um cotton farming uh community where they see the child labor there and then they step away and say oh we will work with the other buyers with the other friends or we will be pushing the government advocating the government through the business association to make some changes but like Catherine said, the child labor remediation should start very immediately. And these children, they cannot wait two, three years for the government laws or you know legal requirements to change before they can get help. So I think that uh, it, it is important for these companies to use that leverage for both, right? Short-term help for the child labor that they see in their supply chain, do something immediately to remediate that. At the same time, taking more like a community-based approach, like more like area-based approach together with, you know, the government, other companies to solve the issue. So it's both in parallel at the same time and not one over the other. Thanks, Riri. Yeah, let, let's maybe pick up on that point about um, community approaches. Well, I mentioned earlier, um, I also wanted to pick up on the stakeholder engagement that, that Sylvia mentioned. Um, and maybe, Catherine, this is a good question for you um, from an ILO perspective. I'm, I'm just wondering how and with whom companies should uh, engage as part of the remediation process. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, sure, Daniel. And maybe just to build a little bit on the on the remarks from Sylvia and really regarding remediation of obligations um, and differentiation, I encourage all participants who also have a look at the ILO IOE guidelines for businesses on child labor, because that provides also a very, we don't have time to go through it, but it provides a very practical understanding on how to go about remediation. And the responsibility that remains within companies, even in the case of a linkage, to actually increase leverage to, to prevent and mitigate child labor. So even if it's not uh, contributing, even it's not about just a direct contribution to it, when we go into the linkages, there is still a responsibility to increase leverage and look at prevention and mitigation as we, we have mentioned earlier. So just to say that on the leverage, and I think building on the point that really made very important on working on parallel on the immediate needs and the long-term systemic issues. Um, the ILO has what we call a child labor platform that brings multinationals from different sectors all together. That includes garment companies, agro-industry companies, luxury companies. And in India, just to give a very concrete example about the leverage, we worked to actually identify from which areas where we were these companies sourcing um, raw materials and what would be the leverage that together, not only garment companies, but also the agro-industry and the trading companies could play with other actors and as private sector. So we, pro we carry out that study in, in Telangana that was just concluded a few months ago. 27 companies joined together that effort. There was a discussion with the government, the trade unions, and it's going to come with the employee organizations about uh, specifically the responsibilities of each actor. And I want to underline this because the point of the ILO is not only that there is a responsibility for companies to provide or to give access to remediation, but also responsibility from states to protect children from child labor. So here the discussion with the government and with the local actor has been on, okay, if we are aiming at, at remediating child labor in the cotton supply chain, in the spice supply chain, in the sugar cane of the Telangana state, for instance, how would government ensure that we have access to primary education and so that companies can immediately refer to children that have been identified through public schools because that's part of the state's obligation. What can the government of Telangana and these companies do in terms of youth employment? Very important in terms of breaking the cycle of child labor. And what are those joint actions that both government and companies would do in setting up programs that are actually meeting market needs and that have a, a way of being sustainable in the long term, not just depending on, on temporary ad hoc interventions? How do we strengthen cooperatives? And I want to stress that point because maybe we haven't spoken enough about the cooperatives, but these are a key actor at the level of cotton production. A lot of the workers are actually informal workers, but engaging through cross-sectoral discussion with these cooperatives that are actually sourcing, whether that's spices, that's cotton, whether it's sugarcane, 
it really creates a leverage to ensure that the cooperatives that are organizing these workers through their systems have actually the same type of due diligence mechanism across the area where the companies are sourcing from. So these are the different examples that we are seeing in terms of increasing the leverage. Now, some of those examples lead to immediate action, uh, as really was mentioning, immediate uh, protection of children from child labor, and others are part of addressing the systemic issues of child labor. So both need to go hand in hand. But I think the example of the child labor platform is a good example to say companies has come to an understanding that even you have to probably go beyond your garment peers and start looking at who, who else is sourcing from there. What are they doing in the agro industry? There's a lot of efforts that need to be connected with what we are doing in the cotton sector. And just to conclude on this, uh, in terms of the background of the work that we did at the child labor platform, actually the request came from a non-garment, non-cotton company saying, I understand that I'm sharing the same labor force with companies that are sourcing spices from the same region in India. As we source the same labor force because workers are migrating from one commodity to the other, can we work together? Can we do this leverage together? And the approach from the government was actually very positive because the fact that it was not just a very scrutinized commodity, but a, a sum of different commodities helped to have a different response or different type of of reaction from, from government authorities and from the government in general. So this is one example of where leverage is extremely effective and really helps us accelerate the responses. That's great. Thank you, Catherine. Those are really helpful um, and practical examples, I think. Um, you mentioned about the informal sector and, and I, I don't want to move on to prevention because you you also mentioned that and I we have a number of questions to get to on prevention but before we do that I'm thinking of you Sylvia and Goodweave's work um, in the informal sector so I'm I'm wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit about that and how um, companies can engage in remediation in areas such as uh, with home workers for example yeah absolutely. Um... So I will be speaking from our experience at Goodweave, um, and we do have teams in India and Nepal that work in subcontracted supply chains, as I explained before, and there is a very high um, uh, presence of home workers. Uh, we've done work with a lot of companies that did not think they had home workers in their supply chains. Um, so we always recommend that the first step is to recognize that home workers are part of the actual workforce um, and uh, uh, as much as possible create home worker policies or include a mention of home workers in subcontractor policies because this is an area that is often not addressed and leaves a lot of uh, confusion also in terms of suppliers on whether they can or cannot uh, subcontract orders to home workers. Um, it's then very important to work with local partners to track if there are home workers in the supply chain. Um, uh, often companies think that home workers only do value add tasks like uh, uh, garment embellishment, for example, but through our inspections, we have seen a number of uh, home workers also performing tasks that the company would expect to be performed in a factory. And it's really important to work through a local partner um, because um, these um, settings, these work sites are uh, often hidden um, and uh, you need people who are embedded in these communities, in these manufacturing hubs to be able to track them down. Um, through our work, we see children often working uh, at home with parents and not going to school. Um, and uh, there are also cases where children are going to school, but they are performing hazardous work at home with their parents. So there are different cases we come across. And in general, our approach is to um, always um, um, ensure that the child is safe. And uh, the approach to remediation is quite different because you are now talking to the parents or the guardians of the child and not to factory management. So we do have inspectors who are also skilled at having this type of exchanges and um, are embedded in the communities I explained before and can navigate the, the contextual nuances. 
Um, it is important that uh, the child stops working and uh, um, uh, counseling is provided uh, to, the, uh, to the family. Uh, information is provided to explain that child labor is not allowed, uh, not allowed by the law, not allowed by the standard against which our inspectors um, um, conduct their visits. Um, we also have a remediation team that then takes over and conducts, uh, um, uh, um, helps, uh, supports the child in enrolling in, in school, for example, or if they are not regular in school, they track their attendance. And it is very important to follow up um, to make sure that uh, um, there are, that the child stays in school on one hand, and on the other hand, uh, the uh, parents uh, do not uh, um, resume, uh, ask the child to resume working, or in the case of like smaller, informal work sites that are not necessarily home-based work sites, that there are in corrective actions and they are implemented. Um, it's also important to um, ensure, uh, to include the, ch the child in these conversations, right? And one important thing uh, that we often see in our work in Nepal is to ensure that the child that is working at home, if they're working and attending school, if they're okay with this arrangement or there is any other kind of abuse, because a lot of times we see that the child may have like a different take on whether they want to perform this work. Um, so um, lastly, uh, I, I will return to the point of a community-wide uh, approach, which is very important. Um, a lot of companies do not really tackle the home worker problem because it's really resource intensive. Like you literally have to have frequent monitoring, unannounced monitoring to be able to track down and monitor home workers. And a lot of companies don't have these resources, don't have this capacity, don't have this expertise. And at Goodweave, we have our own inspectors, but we've also piloted some very interesting um, approaches whereby we leverage staff, social programming staff, so not inspectors, but social programming staff that is working in the communities implementing, for example, prevention activities. And we have leveraged their involvement in monitoring cases of child labor and tracking that they stay in remediation. And this has proved very efficient because these people are already in the communities, they're already trusted by their communities, and they have provided a lot of information uh, from the bottom up that has nicely complemented the work that our inspectors have done. Thanks so much for that, Sylvia. It's uh, quite a tricky thing. And so you've articulated that well. And I, I know we have uh, many companies um, on the webinar as well. So I certainly encourage them um, to get in contact with Goodweave and, and all of our panelists as well um, uh, to take their remediation efforts further. Um, I do want to turn to prevention now because we are getting on in our panel time and this is as we set out in the very beginning in the opening remarks, um, prevention is a key aspect um, and that's specifically in order to tackle those root causes of child labor, which we heard Catherine mention in the opening question. And so Anne-Marie, I would like to uh, hear a little bit more about ILO's uh, pilot project in Bangladesh and how that might help to mitigate child labor, because perhaps initially that's or at first blush, we might not think uh, of it as a child labor remediation program, but there are some links there. So I'm wondering if you can maybe um, tell us about the program and then tease those out a little bit. Yes, thank you very much, Danielle, and thank you, thank you to the core for the invitation. It was also great to listen to the other panelists. I really enjoy their experience and very knowledgeable um, comments they're making on the issue of child labor. Um, what I'm going to do, Danielle, is um, before I dig into the pilot, I think it's important just to place the pi pilot into a more global uh, perspective, which is the perspective of social protection. And basically what I would like to argue, and I think there are some questions in the chat uh, that are linked to that, I would like to argue that the so social protection measures can be effective to address the root causes of child labor and thus prevent child labor. There was an interesting report published by the uh, jointly by the ILO and UNESCO in 2022 on this very topic. So if you are interested to know more about the link between social protection measures and child labor prevention, I really invite you to read that report. 
But in in a nutshell, the purpose of social protection is to reduce the risk of family uh, to fall into poverty or to be more vulnerable. And social pro protection aims at, to protect families' uh, livelihoods, including uh, through schooling and education. But let me go a little bit deeper into one branch of social protection, which is employment injury protection. So re seems a little bit remote from child labor, but I will try to walk you through their, uh, their relation. Employment injury protection is one of the oldest branch of social security. It provides medical access and income replacement compensation in case of temporary or permanent working capacity. In case of death, the, it provides uh, for income replacement compensation to the dependent family members of the diseased worker. It is the corollary of the fundamental obligation of employers to ensure a safe and healthy place uh, of work. No one can ever say that a place of work is at zero risk of accident. You always have, you always have to ask yourself, what if there is an accident at work? What is in place? In a fully integrated system, this employment injury protection should be linked to prevention, rehabilitation, and return to work measures. Now, in the absence of a protection scheme against work-related injury, um, this could have significant negative impact on child labor. Let me just name a few. First, it can create economic pressure when adults do not have access to coverage for work-related injury. They may face a financial insecurity in case of an accident, and this lack of financial protection can lead to a situation where families are forced to re rely on income generated by child labor to make ends meet. Second, Without protection scheme for work-related injury, adults who suffer an accident at work may have difficulty in finding alternative employment or even accessing rehabilitation or return to work services. This, again, can lead to a loss of income and reduced earning capacity for the household. And you can easily imagine the impact that could have on the possibility of having recourse to child labor. So the lack of work alternatives and the long-term consequences of work-related injuries, such as medical expenses that can be very high, can perpetuate the cycle of poverty within families. And as a result, children may be forced into labor to compensate for the economic losses experienced by their injured family members. Because of its obvious importance on the livelihoods of families, one would expect that employment injury protection is widely in place uh, in the world. Unfortunately, the coverage of workers and their family with an efficient uh, scheme for, uh, in, for protection against work-related injury is far from being fully achieved. The ILO has calculated that less than 40% of the workers that are in the formal sector are effic 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 efficiently covered. So now the question is how to stimulate and put into place such scheme, considering the impact it could have on the workers and their family members. And this is, uh, Danielle, where the pilot is an interesting business model. The the pilot uses the leverage of the market and the collective leverage of international buyers in the garment sector to transform a national situation where there is no protection against work-related injury to a situation where you have a system, a scheme that is embedded into the law. The ILO is, well, this pilot, which is fully owned by the national actors, so it's not owned by the ILO, it's fully owned by the national actors and social partners, is currently being carried out in Bangladesh. 
And if you give me the time, Daniel, I just want to explain in a nutshell how it works. Well, since the Rana Plaza tragedy, which occurred 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago now, the ILO has been supporting the authorities and social partners in their efforts to put into place a, an effective protection scheme against work-related injury. And now since June 2022, so almost two years now, international brands have joined these efforts. And we are convinced at the ILO that the leverage of brands can make a difference. Responsibility are not shifted. And I think it's very important to stress that responsibility lies with the authorities. Brands are just contributing to the transformative process that was initiated. And how do we work? And I think that now I'm repeating a little bit of the things that the other panelists have, have said. I'm just confirming that this is one way to go. On the one hand, you have the ILO and the German Development Cooperation Agency that are working in a partnership in a partnership to support authorities and social partners and institution to build and to build the capacity to build knowledge to build experience, including in financial governance capacity. On the other hand, the brands accept to cover the gap between what is what the law provides in case of work-related injury and what should be provided in the light of international labor standard. So it is, I would qualify this as a multifaceted initiative that is based on trust, cooperation, and knowledge sharing. It is time-bound. It will not go beyond June 2027. 2020, 2020, and it should result into a fully-fledged, nationally-owned employment injury protection embedded in the national legislation and covering all sectors of activities in Bangladesh. Uh, I'd love to share, Daniel, I don't know if I have time because I see the time is running, but just, I just want to share because I think it's important always to put a human face to what we're doing. Uh, the first case that the pilot addressed, so it's fully operational, it's paying attention. The, the first case that the pilot addresses is a case of a worker that died, who died in a factory in August 2022. He left behind a widow, a dependent father, and two twins. Um, without the pilot, so only with the money that uh, the lump sum that was paid according to the law, clearly this family would have would have struggled quite a lot to live in decency. But with the uh, money that was provided, the compensation that was paid by the pilot, the widow became the breadwinner, and the the widow. How can I say this? became empowered in terms of supporting the family. She was able, she testified about that. It's very interesting. Her kids, her young kids, she could keep her kids in school. And with the cash she received, she was able to buy a land, to buy some livestock, and she continued to work into the factory of uh, her, diseased, uh, her, her diseased husband. So this is one concrete example about uh, how empowering good measure of social protection could be. I will stop here again, but I, and I thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you for that, Emery. I think uh, it's really helpful to have those examples because we do wanna take that step back and have uh, a broader look at, at uh, you know, solutions in terms of child labor remediation. And certainly um, there are those pilot project might be one of those options. Um, I'm wondering if maybe we can continue uh, along with this uh, line of questioning in terms of prevention strategies and maybe talk about uh, community-based prevention specifically. So we heard a lot in our earlier discussion about how um, uh, stakeholder engagement and community engagement specifically uh, is really critical uh, to child labor remediation. So maybe Sylvia, you can touch on this um, with respect to prevention. 
Certainly. Um, yeah, good weave. Uh, I, I talked a bit about our work in inspections and in supply chains, but we do support uh, prevention activities as well. And, uh, you know, in our work in you know, over like, like 30 years, actually, this year, uh, we've learned that community based and community led prevention has impacts that go beyond just the supply chain where the company operates. So they reach much wider than just a handful of suppliers. Unfortunately, what we've also also know after 30 years is that companies, many companies still see prevention only as supplier capacity building and think that community based activities are out of, out of their scope. Um, they are something that NGOs only should focus on, to, to say it in other words. Um, but companies should invest in community-based prevention. Uh, we, we heard it uh, before from, from Catherine. Uh, solutions will not be sustainable if there is no long-term prevention designed within those solutions. Um, and one aim uh, for the companies should be to have long-lasting uh, relationship with supplier in a certain area and uh, um, work with them and the community uh, toward transforming these communities into labor-free zones. Riri mentioned this as well uh, before. Um, this is something that we have done practically on the ground in India for 30 years. Um, we support uh, over 40 worker communities um, with prevention programming, where we um, work, we link these communities to the supply chains of the brands and retailers we work with, and we have a stable presence in these communities. So each household is uh, every year is surveyed to identify children uh, that are school age, so between 6 and 14, uh, who are at risk of child labor. And we define at risk if a child is not attending school or is behind in their um, age appropriate learning levels. And we focus on this community, all the at risk children, not only the children we identify as child laborers in the supply chains where we operate. We offer them um, enrollment programs, so we support them uh, re-enter or stay in mainstream education, and we track their attendance and we intervene if they drop out of school uh, through talking to the parents and talking to the child. We have also established what we call motivation and learning centers. And these are centers that are active after school hours and uh, um, help and work with the most vulnerable children to involve them in learning through play-based educational activities so that they can catch up with their age appropriate learning levels. Because we've seen that many times the children are embarrassed, ashamed, or have lost hope that they can catch up with their peers. And so they just don't have any option really to, um, to re reintegrate in mainstream education. Um, and of course, uh, be beyond working with the children, we work with community leaders. That's key. It's very important to have the support of school uh, principals, um, religious leaders. We work in a lot of Muslim communities where children attend uh, um, uh, classes at the mosque instead of a mainstream school. Um, we engage with uh, local authorities, uh, and this is all aimed at community mobilization. And we reassess the learning levels of children every year so we can track how many are improving and how many are staying in school with the objective to have them graduate, uh, at least complete their mandatory, um, mandatory school. Thanks for that, Sylvia. Um, that's very helpful. Um, I think maybe Riri, you can uh, pick up on uh, this aspect of prevention strategy, and I, I actually want to weave in one of the one of the Q and A questions with respect to the difference between child labor uh, and young worker labor, um, and I I'm hoping maybe you can um, you know sort of speak to that first, and then maybe talk about how employing young workers in decent work might serve as a prevention strategy, if at all. Sure, sure. I think let, let's start with that question first, right? Um, I think in the beginning, um, Sherry also explained on this and Catherine also touched on this. So basically, child labor can be two, two scenarios, right? One is under age, like children under the minimum age to work. In most countries, it is 15, but in some countries, it's 14. 
like in Bangladesh and India, it's 14. In China, it's 16. You know, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, it is 15. But I know convention says it is 15 and, you know, sometimes it's 14 and 16 in, in like 14 in like developing countries, right? And this is the minimum age to work that is set in by each of the government in, in respective countries. So child labor can be children under this minimum age to work who are working, you know, like usually the full time doing hazardous work, you know, they are exposed to danger, um, you know, like exposure to chemical, exposure to uh, very extreme um, uh, weather uh, exposure, you know, all these things. But at the same time, child labor can also be what we call as young worker in hazardous work. So young worker, they are technically children because they are still below 18. 18 is like the benchmark for definition of a child, but they are above the minimum working age. So let's say in Indonesia, it would be from 15 to below 18, 15 to 17. Like in Bangladesh, it's going to be from 14 until 17. In India, also 14 to 17. In China, 16 to 17. So they are technically children, but they are above the minimum working age. If this group of young workers doing hazardous work, like I mentioned before, you know, like they are doing overtime, they are doing night shift, or they are working in a very high position that requires them to climb, or they are working underground, all of these, um, you know, classified as hazardous work, then they are young workers doing hazardous work, which means child labor. So... Um, I, I think that that's that's the differentiations. Like they are all child labor. It's just their their age determining and their their type of work, how long they are doing the work, and the environment that they are working. Um, so that defines the child labor. Now let's go to the young workers, which is very interesting because I think that Catherine has touched on this since the very first beginning of this discussion and how decent work for youth for the young people is also, um, you know, something that we have to do to make sure, you know, part of the prevention strategy. Because at the center, uh, we, we've seen as well that lack of decent employment opportunity for young workers. Again, above the minimum working age, but they are still below 18, so technically children. Um, and that the formal sector is actually closing the door from them. It's just push them, you know, like this systemic exclusion from formal, decent, dignifying work um, you know, actually just pushing them into the lower tiers, which offer usually inadequate security, no labor protection, and they end up in a child labor situation, lower pay, longer working hours, excluded from social protection schemes that and Mary was explaining. And we've seen this in Indonesia and in India and in Sri Lanka and Vietnam in Bangladesh, you know, where are these children out of school, out of training, out of employment, because of there's no decent work for them, they were being pushed to lower tiers with very minimal protection. So at the center, we believe that, you know, one vulnerable youth integrated into decent work opportunity is one child labor less. So uh, I think to date in 2023, I'm looking at the number now, is around 762 young workers have been working under improved health and safety conditions after our interventions with our clients and with the factors. And nearly 300 out of school youth under, uh, now have been integrated into decent work opportunity. They were so proud, you know, wearing uniforms, signing, um, you know, with their parents' consent, signing the contract. They are working, you know, according to the allowable uh, maximum working hours, no overtime. They got paid at least minimum wage, you know, they got bank account, you know. They, they feel that it's like a second chance for them because they are breadwinner of the families, right? And these children, sometimes they were once child labor and they were integrated to decent work opportunity. And for those who were not, you know, uh, given this opportunity to do decent work, we prevented them actually from ending up in a child labor situation. And these kids, they were, um, they were given training, like technical training. They were assigned to non-hazardous work position, you know, like taking example in the garment factory, for example, they are the cutting assistant. So they are not technically holding the scissors and the sharp knife, but they are, you know, doing this uh, calculation, the measurement, they are giving fabrics to the, you know, the work cutting worker, or they are usually in the packing department, you know, like once the goods is finished, they put that inside the box, 
they do the you know plastic seal, they put the tag, they put the name. There are a lot of actually work positions in a garment factory that are non-hazardous, then these young workers can be there working decent work, you know, protected with social protection and so on and so forth. So, so yeah, I think that that's a bit of sharing from how we are doing that at the center, giving opportunity for the young workers together with the clients, like international buyers in the supply factories, like in Vietnam, in Indonesia, in Bangladesh, in China as well. Thank you so much for that, Riri. Um, I have done my best to sort of integrate some of our Q&A questions as we've gone along. Um, we have come to the end of our panel discussion, so I, I don't want to uh, leave, though, without giving um, just an opportunity for each of our panelists to give a last word. I just ask that you keep it quite short, um, if you can. Um, so, Riri, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um very short thing is that we rarely see a company which has taken a comprehensive remediation process for an identified case of child labor will fall again in the future into the same hole. So when they are taking steps actually to protect the identified child labor, improve their management system, increase their skill and knowledge, they are in so much better place once the remediation is done, you know, in terms of policy improvement, practice, internal capacity to prevent and remediate uh, cases of child labor. So last word for me is from our experience, we have seen how remediation, if done properly, is the best form of child labor prevention. Thanks, Riri. Catherine, you're next on my screen. Thanks, Daniel. This has been really a great, very rich uh, conversation. So just to end, I would say first, um, join others. I think this is a very clear message. Um, we keep saying it, but there is still not enough people doing it with others. So this is a message that comes uh, in all discussions and we're still seeing a lot of companies trying to solve the issue by themselves. My first call is join others that will be more sustainable and more efficient and more and, and less costly than if you do it alone. The second thing is about, we spoke a lot about prevention and I want to stress the importance of looking at decent work of parents and and young people, I, I think I have mentioned this a lot, but that is clearly the best option we have in front of us to end child labor and have really sustainable supply chain. So when you look at child labor, understand and start addressing with others decent work for parents, including the right to organize in supply chains, which because of a limited time, we didn't manage to, to cover that, but that is extremely important. So empowering not only communities, but workers themselves as workers to be able to bargain and to express their collective interest uh, at those levels of supply chains. That would be my, my last comment. Thanks, Catherine. Anne-Marie, would you like to jump in? Yes, first of all, I would like to thank uh, thanks the I would like to thank the interpreters for their patience to follow what we're saying, sometimes a little bit in a speedy manner. Uh, but I would join Catherine in saying, uh, in, I think that any uh, action should be weighed against its potential to be sustainable. Uh, sometimes a uh, short-term action with not a vision to make sure that it's sustainable can create more harm than anything else. So I would put the best interest of the child at the center. I would look for sustainability. And today, sustainability can only come if you have the public authorities with you. So you work on the one hand of the screen, of the spectrum, at the local level, in making sure that the victims, the beneficiary, the children, the families, the support suppliers understand what is being tackled, but you also need to work on the other side of the spectrum with the strong legal framework, strong policies aiming at eradicating and preventing child labor. And of course, yes, remediation need to exist. And I would also add that if you have a child working, if you have a, a young worker, if you have child labor, and because it might, it exists, then if they are injured, they should have access to medical care. That's part of employment injury protection. This is fundamental. Thank you again to CORE. Thanks, Emery. Sylvia, very quickly. Sure, 100% um, agree with what has just been said. I would add leverage local partners. Um, they can really help businesses navigate local contexts and be prepared to 
always contextualize with these local partners remediation. Uh, even if a company has a great strategy in place, uh, providing remedy is not a fixed sequence of steps. It's not going from A to B. We're talking about people, we're talking about children. Each child will have different needs. Each child's family will see the, the you know, will have different needs as well. So it's really important to not forget the human aspect and to include uh, the human side of remediation uh, in any due diligence design that companies are undertaking. Wonderful, thank you, Sylvia. And to all of our panelists, thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Sherry now for our closing remarks. Thank you, Danielle. <clears throat> and as Danielle said, this concludes our panel. And I wanna thank um, our expert panelists, Catherine, Amory, Riri, and Sylvia um, that have joined us today. And we've learned about concrete steps and approaches that can be adopted in facing child labor um, in supply chains. So I look forward to continuing work with uh, you all, as well as with Canadian garment companies and other stakeholders to strengthen responsible conduct in this sector. I would also like to thank our wonderful interpreters, as well as Oxygen Events for the technical coordination of this webinar, Daniel Bennett and the rest of the core team, and last but not least, our audience for your lively participation on the Q&A uh, and your interest in this important issue. For more information about the core, ILO, Goodweave International, and the Center for Child Rights and Business, please see the links in the chat um, to your respective web websites. And thanks again, everyone. Merci, gracias. Gracias.